Okay, so I'm going to talk about format preserving encryption for the next um, three hours or so. And even though Sasha kind of gave a general motivation, I'd like to start with specific motivation for format preserving encryption. So this is the textbook example. We have some medical records. So maybe a hospital has their medical database. And the reason that we're using this is because we all intuitively understand that our medical history is something that we want to preserve uh, private. So let's say a new person comes um, into the hospital. So they open up a medical record for him or her, and then this medical record is sent to the database, and they perform some kind of um, check to see that this uh, record was opened correctly. So this means you check that if you have some identification number, like a social security number, it's a valid social security number. You check that if you have some payment method, let's say a credit card number, it's a valid credit card number. Now, nowadays, no one stores their database locally. Everyone stores them at some remote server in the cloud. Of course, this is private data. It's very sensitive. We're not going to just send all these medical records to the cloud. We're going to encrypt them first. But this introduces a problem. You know, if you had this table with a field for social security number, that's a nine-digit string. You encrypt it using, I don't know, AES, you get 128 bits back. That's too long to store instead of a nine-digit string. So you might not be able to store the encrypted data in the same tables as the unencrypted data. And of course, we always have this so-called solution of just regenerating the tables. This is not a solution. We want to add encryption as an additional layer that gives us privacy. If we require the users to just re generate all the tables and re-enter all the data, they're not going to use our encryption scheme. And this problem here is not a problem of computation, unlike what Sasha discussed. This is a problem of actually storing the data. Okay, but let's say somehow, you know, we overcame this or it didn't come up. We have our database now in the cloud. And now a new person walks in, we open up a medical record for him or her, we want to send it to the database, so first we encrypt it, we send it to the database. Now what does the database do? It runs this application, this program that checks that a valid social security number appears, that a valid credit card number appears, but it doesn't, right? What we see there are just bit strings, it looks like garbage. So applications that are, um, sorry, applications that are meant to use the data might crash. And again, we have this so-called solution, just rewrite the application, right? I mean, re-encrypt or whatever, check that this is in the image of all possible social security numbers. That's not a solution. Okay, so this is what we'll talk about, about solutions for these problems and how to do format preserve encryption. So in this first session, which will probably take more than an hour, but we'll break in the middle, um, we're going to take a detour first. We're going to talk about tweakable ciphers. Then I'll introduce format preserving encryption. We'll see all kinds of uh, definitions for its security. And finally, uh, we'll get to constructions. So in this session, I'm going to only talk about deterministic private key encryption. And the reason that we're talking about this is for functionality, and Sasha already discussed this. So in a deterministic encryption scheme, we all know it. We have this message space that we want to encrypt. We have a randomized key generation algorithm. This generates a private key. And we have deterministic encryption and decryption algorithms. And what we want from this scheme is first correctness. If we encrypt and we decrypt, then we get back the message. And we want secrecy. The ciphertext would hide the message. And Usually we're going to pick a random um, private key and kind of hardwire it into the scheme and talk about running the scheme with one private key hardwired into it. So I'm going to use this private key as a, a subscript. And if you think of this, the unpredictability of the scheme, the fact that, the, that from seeing the ciphertext you don't know what the message is, this comes from the key. So if you choose the key at random and you keep it private, your encryption algorithm with this key hardwired into it, it should look like a random permutation over the message space. But it turns out that sometimes this is not enough. And when is it not enough? It's not enough when our, um, when our message space is very small. And sometimes, you know, you might think that your message space is not small, but it turns out that it is. 
And as an example, let's look at credit card numbers. So you know, take out your card, it has 16 digits on it, so this looks like quite a lot of digits. But if we break it down, the first six digits are the issuer and bank number. This you need to keep in the clear, you can't encrypt this. The last four digits are check digits. These two you need to keep in the clear, right? Whenever you pay, you see those last four digits on your receipt. The only thing that's specific to you is your account number, which is the middle six digits. So now if we come to encrypt these 16 digits, we don't. What we encrypt is just the six digits in the middle. Now the problem with this is that if we get a different credit card number and we only encrypt the middle six digits and they just happen to be the same, then we would get two ciphertexts that would share the same six digits in the middle. And this would allow us to do something called a dictionary attack. So basically I take all the credit card numbers that I know, I encrypt them, I see like all the ciphertexts that I know. I can't encrypt them because I don't know the private key, sorry about that. But I have the, the, let's say my credit card number and I also know the ciphertext. I can keep just these six digits, okay? in a table, and whenever I get a new um, uh, encrypted credit card number, I go to my table and I see if these six middle digits, do they match something in the table. If they do, I was able to decrypt a new credit card number, a credit card number whose encryption I didn't know. So basically, this is what we would want. If I encrypt my credit card number, like if someone encrypts my credit card number and someone encrypts your credit card number, they use different keys. This is what we want so that we wouldn't be able to do these dictionary attacks. And of course, this is something we can't do. We can't pick the, the, um, the encryption key based on the message. But what we can do is we can take our encryption algorithm and tweak it a little bit. And we're going to do that using the public information that is available to us, like the issuer and bank number or the check digits, something that everyone knows because we don't encrypt. We're going to use this to kind of make our encryption algorithm a little bit different. So how are we going to do this? So we're starting again with a deterministic private key encryption scheme, but we're adding a new aspect to it, which is a tweak space. And our encryption and decryption algorithm, in addition to taking this key, will now also take this tweak. And I'm going to add this tweak as the superscript. So now we have encryption with key K and tweak T. So it's gonna be E sub K superscript T. So this tweak is, a, is public information. It doesn't add to the unpredictability. The only thing you don't know is still the key. But what we want is that if you fix one random private key and you use two different tweaks, it's like using two different permutations altogether. So this means that the tweaks kind of give us a family of pseudorandom permutations. You pick one key and you get, instead of one pseudorandom uh, permutation, you get a whole bunch of them, depending on the tweak that you use. So these tweaks are fundamentally different than the key. You're not supposed to hide them. It's okay that people know what they are. You are actually using the public information, but it adds kind of variability. You're going to use a different um, uh, encryption algorithm for any message that you're encrypting. So let's go back to this uh, example of, of credit card numbers. So before what we had is we had two different credit card numbers with the same middle six digits, which is what we encrypt. And when we encrypted it, we got the same six digits in the middle. And what happens when we have tweaks is that we're going to use a different encryption for each of these um, uh, middle six digits. So we're going to use all the public information for the tweak. So what public information do we have? We have, have alpha or alpha prime, which is our issuer and bank number. We have beta or beta prime, which is the, um, uh, the check digits. And we're going to tweak with these issuer and bank number, alpha, and with the check digits, beta. So we're tweaking with the public information. We're still encrypting this, these middle six digits. But now these are like completely pseudorandom, uh, different pseudorandom permutations. So what we get in the middle are two similar, like they look completely independent, the encryptions that we get of the middle six digits. Questions? I didn't tell you, but you're free to ask me. Sure. Yeah. They are quite dependent, right? I mean, your beta does depend on... So, okay. 
So the question was, you know, you're saying that they're independent, but when you're looking at the last four digits, they depend on what happened before, so it would be dependent. So in general, when we're doing tweakable encryption, we're using all the public information. It's true that sometimes we're using things that are dependent, but the issuer and bank number are independent. Okay, so, so I, I agree that in this specific example, it looks like you shouldn't take your check digits in, but usually we kind of bump everything in, even if it doesn't really help uh, in adding security. But actually, the only way to get the same thing, really encrypting using the same pseudorandom permutation, is if you have the same issuer and bank number and the same check digits. This means you have the same account number, so it's the same credit card. You would never have... You would, you would never be doing the same encryption with the same key and the same tweak unless it's the same message in this example. Okay. So, yeah. What would happen if I just encrypted the whole thing? So we're really um, function, functionality oriented here. People are not going to encrypt that, right? Because think of your, your seats when you're paying with your credit card number. The four digits in the end, the check digits, they have to be in the clear. No, just um, you can uh, still keep it in the clear, but just for uh, so you, you don't have the same cipher test, you just encrypt everything. I don't see how if you encrypt, if, if your idea is to encrypt everything together. No, just uh, like the main test will be everything, but the public will be the private information. And uh, you don't have a case of the cipher test is the same. I'm not sure I understand your suggestion, but there are two things to note here. One is that I do want to hide the account number, so I don't want to give everything in the clear. So I can only give the first six digits and last four digits. And the other thing is that I can't encrypt everything. So you're saying, why don't I encrypt everything and attach to it the account number and the... So that's just, I mean, you're encrypting a whole lot, right? Instead of just um, encrypting what you want to encrypt. So actually, I think that this idea um, is something that people used to use, but not in this so, context. So, uh, efficiency? so uh, not efficiency as much as it's not the right way to do it. Let's, let me just move on to the next slide, and maybe that will answer your question, OK? So just to give you kind of a context for tweakable encryption, um, it wasn't introduced in the context of uh, format preserving encryption. It was introduced in the context of block ciphers where you want to encrypt very long messages. So you kind of do this, Sasha did it for me, mode of operation, right? So you're encrypting one block and then you're encrypting the next. And, and if you want to get this variability, the fact that you have different, that you can't be able to, to <laughs> notice that the first block is the same and all these things that Sasha discussed, then you use this IV, this initialization vector that um, should be random. And then these people came and they said, this is not the right way to do it. If we want variability, then, then what you're using is, is not good. You shouldn't be using block ciphers. They are not, they don't give you variability. So you need to take your block cipher and change that and make that tweakable. So that's kind of what you were suggesting. We're going to solve this problem by just looking at everything, whereas we're not interested in looking at everything. We're just interested in encrypting the middle six digits. So this is something people have looked at, but they came to the conclusion that that's not the right way to go. So unlike these solutions here for block ciphers that you might say, ah, maybe it's just you know, nice to have. It's the right abstraction. When we're talking about small domains like the credit card number um, example, then these tweaks are essential. If we don't have it, then we have a tax. And when we're talking about formats that we want to preserve, what we want to do format preserve encryption on, many times these formats are very, very small, like social security numbers and credit card numbers. These are like nine digit strings, 16 digit strings, six digit strings. It's a very, very small space. So tweaks are really essential. So this is why, when we're talking about format preserving encryption, our starting point would be a tweakable encryption scheme. And to it, we'll add something else. OK, so now after our detour, we're kind of ready to talk about format preserving encryption. 
So in general, when we encrypt, you know, what we get back is garbage. It shouldn't look anything like the message. And we already saw that this is very problematic when you want to use the data. Sometimes we do want to preserve some properties of the plain text. So what we would want is something like our ciphertext space to be the same as our message space, meaning that our encryption uh, scheme, when we, when we take our encryption algorithm and hardwire some uh, secret key into it, we would get a pseudorandom permutation over our um, uh, message space. But actually, if we're thinking about encrypting a lot of formats, all the formats that were all the kind of messages we're interested in encrypting, we have a lot of different formats. So for example, we might be, be interested in encrypting social security numbers and credit card numbers and dates and maybe some number. So for example, this might be encrypting some transaction, right? It's who you are, what kind of method you used, when did you do that, and maybe some kind of, I don't know, identification or the, the number that you got, confirmation number or something like that. And we don't want to encrypt a social security number into a credit card number. That's not really what we want to do. We want to encrypt each part separately. So when we're thinking of, about this message format, it's actually the union over a lot of formats, right? It's like the social security numbers, the credit card numbers, the dates, etc. And each, each of these like subformats, this, the smaller set of messages that have the same format, these are called slices. So we're interested in encrypting a lot of so-called slices, each slice within itself. So one other example we could think of is maybe we're interested in encrypting bit strings, but we want to preserve their lengths. Something else we might be interested in doing is encrypting some number in some domain. Now in this case, you know, if you get a number, two, what's its format? Is it a number between one and three? a number between 1 and 5, a number between 1 and 20. Just from seeing the message, you don't know what it fo its format is. So when we are interested in encrypting, I know I'm not done yet by the time, right? Um, so if we're interested in encrypting um, a lot of formats, we might not be able to tell from the message what the format is. So we need to kind of specify what is the format in relation to which we want to encrypt. So you give this number two. Do you want to encrypt it between one to three? Do you want to encrypt it between one and five or one and 20? Yeah. Is the reason that you're considering these multiple slices, is it a security reason or a convenience reason? I mean, I would just consider four independent keys for, like independent keys for every slice. Um, okay, so the question was why am I doing why am I considering different slides? Is it because of efficiency or, uh, or because of security? So I'm not talking here about which key I'm going to use for encryption. I'm talking about what is the, 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 this, if I want the ciphertext space to be the same as the message space, what is the message space in relation to which I'm doing the encryption? And if I want to support a lot of formats and I want to encrypt each format onto itself, then that's the question, you know, I get, Let's say I get a nine-digit string. Is that a social security number? Is it just a nine-digit string? Is it a number between one and gazillion? I don't know. I mean, I have to specify what format it has. But the question is, do you particularly want to use the same key for all these slices? So we would, but I don't think that it matters. You could use different keys, but this is just for, here it is a, a, a matter of efficiency, right? You don't want to hold for it. These, you might have a lot of formats. You want to have one key, okay? Okay, so this last idea was that the message might not give you an idea of what the format is. So we need to kind of give the encryption algorithm also a description of the format. So this is what format preserving encryption is. It's a deterministic, private key, tweakable encryption algorithm, uh, encryption scheme. It has with it, associated to it, a format space, which basically just describes all the supported formats, what you can encrypt. And then we have the message space. The messages that you can encrypt, it's just the union of all messages over all supported formats. So each M sub N is a slice. It's like social security numbers or credit card numbers, etc. And we want it to be finite so that we have this idea of what a permutation over it is. 
And of course, we have the tweak. And again, we have our randomized key generation algorithm. And now our deterministic encryption algorithm takes a key as before, takes a tweak as before, and the message. But it also takes a description of what the format of this message is. And it returns either something that looks like a valid message or an error symbol, this bot. This bot should be distinguishable from the messages, right? No valid message looks like bot. And when do we return this? We return this when we're asking to encrypt something that doesn't have the right format, meaning we're saying, this is the format that I want to encrypt, social security numbers. And what I give you is like a date. These don't match. And that's the only time when the encryption algorithm might fail. So it's not a question of the tweak. It's not a question of the key. It's just a question of whether the message that you gave really has the format that you're uh, saying that it has. Now, if it didn't fail, if you gave a key, a tweak, and you gave this format in, then what you get is a permutation over the corresponding slice. So if you're asking for encryption of social security numbers, your encryption algorithm would give you a permutation over uh, social security numbers. And decryption, again, takes a key, a tweak, the ciphertext, and the description of the format of the ciphertext, and would either fail if you, the ciphertext doesn't have this format that you're claiming that it has, or it would return the decryption. And I'm going to add this description of the format in the superscript right after the tweak. So this is the syntactic definition. Now, what are the properties that we want? So the first thing we want is correctness. Encrypt, decrypt, you get back your message. So for every key, for every tweak, for every format, when you give a message with that format, you encrypt it, you decrypt it, you get back the message. What about security? So the first that actually looked at format preserving encryption kind of rigorously were the Lauerist and Park, Rogaway and Steggers in 2009. And they came up with kind of a hierarchy of what we mean when we say that a scheme is secure. So the strongest notion is that of pseudorandom permutation. It says, you know, when you take a random private key and you fix it, what you get is that for every tweak and format, you would get a pseudorandom permutation or something that looks like it on, your, um, on the, the corresponding slice, m sub n. And generally, when we're talking you know, about a, an encryption scheme, the best we could hope for is encryption looks pseudorandom. So you take your message, you encrypt it, it's like completely random, invalid, in the, the space of valid ciphertexts. But here we have something else. We know that the encryption algorithm is going to leak the format. You encrypted a social security number, what you get back is a, a social security number. <laughs> So we can't think of a random permutation over the entire space, like everything that we can encrypt. We need to think about different permutations <coughs> over the different slices that we have. So this idea of pseudorandom permutation is just the adaptation of the standard notion that you are probably familiar with to this setting of, um, uh, of format-preserving encryption. Yeah. So it's very hard for me to hear you. So you're saying that the definition depends on the tweak? I mean, the way you define the scheme is everything is expressed in terms of the individual scheme. But you can do this with algorithm Okay, so the question was, I think, um, correct me if I didn't hear you correctly. So why not use different keys instead of using different tweaks? of tweaks. Yeah. So because, again, going back to this history of why tweaks were invented, using a different key is costly. And sometimes it's impossible. Because if I have, think of like credit card numbers, I can't use a different key for my credit card and for your credit card. How do I know that this is a different credit card now? How do I know that I should use this key now and that key later on? I have to have a key for every credit card number? That sounds like it won't, you can't. You can't do that, right? So 
If you want to get, and the thing here is that we're not trying to hide, right? That we have the public information, we're not trying to hide it. We just need to kind of tweak the scheme a little bit. So you could do uh, format preserving encryption without tweaks, but then you would get something that is really insecure because of these dictionary attacks that are not captured by these definitions. The definitions assume that you have a tweak. So I didn't formally define this. Let me kind of show the definition and then we'll talk. I'll, I'll specifically say where we're using the tweak, okay? Okay, so this pseudorandom permutation or PRP security, this is standard crypto, right? We're comparing a real world execution with an ideal world execution. We're gonna be in each execution with probability half, in each world with probability half. So in the real world, we have an encryption algorithm. So we pick a random key, now we have this algorithm. The adversary, Lucy, has Oracle access to this algorithm. This means that she can make any number of queries that she wants, this repeats itself. What is a query? You specify the input, so that's a tweak, a format, and a message. You get back the encryption. You gave some message that doesn't have the right format, you get back bot. You gave something that does have the right format, you get back the encryption of this message under the key K that was chosen at random, and tweak T and format M. Now we want to say that this looks like completely random permutations over the slices. So we're going to compare this real world execution with an ideal world execution in which for every tweak and every format, you choose at random a permutation P, T, M, over the, the corresponding slice. So I'm using different permutations. Okay, so if I have a different tweak, I'm using completely different permutations here. This would mean that if my encryption algorithm is indistinguishable from this, then different tweaks use different pseudorandom permutations. And I hope this answers the question here. So this is the difference, right? In the real world, we have our encryption algorithm or encryption oracle. In the ideal world, we have completely pseudorandom permutations. And again, the adversary can make these encryption queries and gets back um, the image under um, uh, these pseudorandom permutations. Of course, if you specify a message M that doesn't have the format M, that you, then you would get back bot. And what we want to say, you know, if, you're, if our encryption algorithm really looks like random permutations, then it should be impossible to distinguish between these two worlds. So what the adversary needs to do is, she needs to venture a guess. What world am I in? Am I talking with the actual encryption oracle, or am I talking with these, this ideal oracle? And now, you can always win with probability half, right? I mean, you pick a random bit, that's going to be, you're gonna win with probability half. What we want, uh, um, to express is that this is not a valid strategy. This, this is always possible, so this doesn't qualify like being able to distinguish. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of normalize our distinguishing advantage such that if you guess at random, you get advantage zero. So this is how we normalize. The PRP advantage of this adversary, Lucy, is twice the probability of guessing correctly minus one. So this measures how well you can do in relation to just guessing at random. So this is the definition. Now it's a great definition. But the problem is, and we'll see later on, that if you want to prove that your scheme really gets PRP security, then it needs to be quite inefficient. And we'll see what I mean by, I'll talk about what this measure of inefficiency is, but it's gonna take it a lot of time to run. And it seems like in typical applications, we're not really interested in pseudorandom permutation security. It's enough to have something a bit weaker, and we might be able to get that with better efficiency. So Bilal et al. didn't stop here. They said, okay, let's try and weaken this security definition. So in this security definition, PRP security, we, have, you, we can send a bunch of encryption queries to either a real oracle or random permutations, and we can't tell the difference. Let's try and kind of weaken this. So now we would only want the adversary to not be able to distinguish one encryption. Now the adversary can only make one encryption, either to a real oracle or to a random permutation. And can the adversary distinguish these two cases? 
Now what we do allow the adversary to do is make a number of encryption queries. And still, she shouldn't be able to distinguish. And these notions are kind of the analog, they have um, similar um, notions in PRF and PRP security. So this is what it looks like. Again, we have these two worlds, the real and ideal. But now, in addition to our adversary, Lucy, we're going to have a challenger, Sally. The first thing Sally does is she picks a random encryption key. Then the adversary is going to choose the, the message or the input on which she wants to be tested. So she specifies a tweak and a format and a message with that format. And she says, this is what I want to be tested on. And then Sally encrypts this message M star under the key that she chose and the format M star and the tweak T star and sends back the ciphertext to Lucy. And now Lucy can make any number of encryption queries that she wants as long as they're unique. And, um, and this is the uh, real world. So here there is one specific challenge input on which uh, Lucy is going to be tested. Now what happens in the ideal world? So again, the challenger will pick a random key, and Lucy will pick the challenge on which she wants to be tested. But now instead of encrypting, what um, Sally is going to do is she's going to generate a completely random ciphertext with the same format as M and send that back to Lucy. So this is the difference between the two worlds. In one world, you get an actual encryption, and in the other world, you just get a random image. And again, Lucy can make any number of encryption queries that she wants. And finally, she needs to guess, you know, where is she? Is she in the real world? Did she get a real encryption? Or did she get a random image? And again, the advantage is measured in the same way. So the SPI, single point of distinguishability, advantage of the adversary is twice the probability of guessing correctly minus one, which is the normalization so that if you make a random guess, your advantage would be zero. So you know why, why do this SPI? So for PRP, we have an adversary that cannot distinguish a lot of encryption queries from a lot of random images. And we have this distinguishing advantage for SPI. You cannot distinguish one point from one, ran the encryption on one point from random. And again, we have the same distinguishing advantage. It turns out that these notions are equivalent, but it's easier to prove that schemes are secure using SPI. So this is like a, this has its pros and cons. On the one hand, these are equivalent notions. So if you can't get PRP security with, with efficient schemes, you also can't get SPI security with efficient schemes. But on the other hand, if you want to know what kind of, a, how, how efficient can you get, you know, what's the lower bound to get PRP security, it's enough to work with SPI. And just to explain what I mean by equivalent notions, so Sasha discussed this, we want to have a reduction. You know, if we have an SPI breaking adversary A, then how well can it do? We're going to build a PRP adversary A prime and use that A prime to bound the advantage of, of the SPI adversary A. And this advantage is roughly the same but you have an additive factor of roughly the number of queries your adversary, ma adversary makes over the minimal size of supported format. And maybe we'll have time later to kind of explain to you why, um, why this is so. So this is the easy direction. It's intuitively kind of clear that if you can't distinguish a lot of encryptions from a lot of random images, then you can't distinguish one encryption from one random image. But it turns out that the other direction also holds. So, um, so if you can't distinguish one encryption from one random point, you won't be able to, um, to distinguish a lot of encryptions from uh, a lot of random points. And here, the, the loss that we have in security is a little larger, and we have this Q times what we had before. So I don't know how the pointer works. So I'll do it this way. Sorry. I don't want to, I know this is like, there's voodoo there, so I don't want to. OK, so basically what we have is we have this advantage times Q. This is what we get here. And the reason that we do this is if you try to kind of work out the proof, we have a hybrid argument here over all possible queries. Queries. We're kind of going from an actual encryption oracle to random. And so the proof here is the same 
except that here we have a hybrid, so we get the Q times the advantage that we had here. So this is kind of to give you an intuition as to why, if you trust me that PRP really is stronger, then you should also kind of believe that SPI is really not weaker. Yeah? M is the, the minimal size of your supported format. So if you have like two supported formats, social security numbers, and the numbers one to gazillion, so it's going to be the number of social security numbers. So hopefully I can do the proof later on, OK? And then I can kind of explain where this comes from, OK? If not, then ask me during the break. Yeah? It depends what you want to encrypt. So for example, if you want to encrypt social security numbers, then it's going to be that. If you want to encrypt credit card numbers, it would be 10 to the power of 6, right? If it could be significantly large? It's true that, OK, so what Hugo is saying is that if you're using um, small formats, then you might, um, so this m is small, then you might basically reach 1, which is the largest distinguishing advantage, and lose everything. That's true that you have a relation here between the number of queries and your format size. But kind of in, as a theoretical aspect, they're the same. I agree that this loss here is something that you shouldn't, that shouldn't be taken lightly. OK? Yeah? I'm not clear if your security analysis is per format. In other words, can you encrypt a message? Can you encrypt a date into a credit card and vice versa? Or you're doing the analysis for each sli the slides separately? OK, so. Um, so when you des design a format preserving encryption scheme, you, des you need to specify what your uh, format space is. So these are all the supported formats. And then you encrypt each format within itself. So if you say that one format is like credit card numbers and one format is dates, then you wouldn't encrypt a credit card number into a date and vice versa. But when we're talking about security, we're talking about the, the scheme as a whole. So you can make encryption queries, some of them you know, asking to encrypt credit card numbers, some of them asking to encrypt dates. And this M here is the smallest slice that you have. Okay, So if you, you are only going to encrypt two dates, this is all the supported dates that you have, then this M is worth nothing. right? This bound is worth nothing. But I don't think you would want to encrypt that. Yes? So the question is if, um, if we're talking about <coughs> social security numbers, there are social security numbers that are considered valid but not really in use. And are you going to encrypt into that? So it depends how you define the format. And usually when we're talking about format preserving encryption for uh, social security numbers, we mean all the social security numbers that are considered valid, even ones that are not currently in use. Because the, 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 you know, the set of social security numbers that are in use is changing like every nanosecond or something. I don't know how, how fast they give birth in the US. But it changes all the time. <laughs> OK. So yeah. Is there a good intuition why you use this 1 over m in both directions? The Q over M. Hmm? Why I mean some Q or Q squared over M. You use them in both directions. So the Q, the Q squared over M here is because of the hybrid argument. So it's Q times. So the real question is why do I lose the Q over M there? So I mean, if I have time to explain this, then I, then I will, OK? Because there is no one. I, if I had a one-liner answer, I would give it to you. But we kind of yeah. need to go through the proof. OK, so this is um, single point indistinguishability. So basically, we said we have pseudorandom permutation security. We have single point indistinguishability. They're equivalent. Pseudorandom permutation means if you have that kind of security, security you need a lot of, of um, your running time is go going to be very, very uh, large. 
So this is the same for a single point of distinguishability. So we're still not there. We can't have efficient schemes that, are, that have SPI security. But actually, if you think about it, usually when we're talking about encryption schemes, what we want is something known as semantic security. We want the ciphertext to not reveal any property of the message. And for the kind of format preserving encryption, um, the analog of it is called message privacy. And we want the ciphertext to be practically no help in computing any property or function of the message. Now, what does this practically mean? If we had randomized encryption, this means nothing, right? You, you, the ciphertext really does not help you. But as Sasha discussed, you know, when we have deterministic encryption, we can always use the encryption oracle as a quality, right? We encrypt, we see if we got the same ciphertext. If so, we know what the message is. If not, we encrypt again and again. So the idea of, of message privacy is to formalize this notion and say that if you know the ciphertext and you can make encryption queries, basically it's the same as not knowing the ciphertext and just making equality queries. Okay, so this is the picture. Oh, and so I changed the slides a little bit and whenever I changed a slide, I put this red square up above. So you know something changed in the slide and if I forget to tell you what, then you can ask. But I will remember this time. So, okay. So we're again comparing a real world execution with an ideal world execution. We have an adversary, we have a challenger. The first thing the adversary does is she picks an advantageous distribution over inputs. So she can pick whatever distribution she wants over tweaks, formats, and messages. So this kind of helps the adversary. She gets to pick the distribution that is favorable to her. Now the challenger would pick a random encryption key it would pick some input, so a triplet, tweak, format, and message according to this favorable distribution that the adversary chose. And she will encrypt this message M star, <coughs> the challenge message, get back a ciphertext C star, send it back to the adversary together with the tweak and the format because Lucy doesn't know, the adversary doesn't know what tweak and format was chosen. So now we know the tweak, we know the format, we know the ciphertext, and the adversary can make some number Q of encryption queries. Now, she can also query about T star, N star, and whatever message she wants. She doesn't know what M star is. If she guesses it, good for her. She can ask for this encryption. She would get back C star. She would be able to compare and know what M star is. And finally, what Lucy needs to do is she needs to specify some function that she thinks she can compute of M star. Okay, so she specifies this function. She says, this property of M star, I can guess. And then she needs to guess what this value is, and this is this Z. So this is the real world. What happens in the ideal world? So in the ideal world, we have a weaker adversary, Lucy, and you can see that she's kind of mad that she's weaker. And the first point in which this adversary is weaker is that she has to pick the same distribution as in the real world. So she can't pick like a very easy distribution, just this message, this is what you're going to encrypt. It's the same distribution as before. And now, and here's the change in your um, printouts, there was um, choosing the key there, which shouldn't be here, it's a bad copy paste. So anyway, the challenger now picks the challenge, the tweak, the format, and the message according to this distribution, and she sends back the tweak and the format. So it, there is no challenge ciphertext here. And now, um, so this is the first difference. The first difference from the real world is that there is no challenge uh, ciphertext that the adversary gets. Now the second difference is in the encryption queries that the adversary can make. She can't make any encryption queries. She can only make equality queries, which is basically, is M the challenge message? No? Is M the challenge message? No? Like that. How many times? Q times. As, at most, as many times as the real world adversary uh, 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 queries her oracle. And then Lucy, the ideal world Lucy, is tested on this specific uh, function f that the real world adversary chose. And she also needs to kind of guess what f of m star is. 
And the advantage here, the empty advantage of the adversary is the probability that she really guessed correctly this property f of m star minus the probability that the best ideal world adversary could guess this. So if this advantage is, is small, it means that whatever property you say you could learn from, making, uh, uh, from seeing the ciphertext and making encryption queries, you could have learned by just making equality queries, which is really we can't do any better than that because uh, uh, we know that deterministic encryption leaks equality queries. So this is message privacy. And you know we can even go further. We can even make a weaker notion, think about a weaker notion, in which the only thing we require is that the ciphertext doesn't completely reveal the message. And we, we started out with saying that an encryption scheme should hide, you know, the ciphertext should hide the message. So this really is the weakest. Like if, given the ciphertext, the adversary knows what the message is, we're done. So here, we're not saying, no, the adversary cannot guess you know, some property of the message. We're just requiring that she can't completely guess what the message is. And this is formalized. Essentially, we have the same game as the message privacy game, this security notion called message recovery. The adversary in the real world, again, chooses a favorable distribution, sends it over, gets back the ciphertext, the tweak and the format, makes Q encryption queries. And in the ideal world, the adversary is kind of bound to the same distribution, doesn't get the ciphertext, can only make equality queries. The difference for message privacy is that you don't need to guess a property. You need to guess what the message is. Now, what is the advantage? The advantage is the probability of guessing correctly in the real world minus the probability that the best ideal world adversary would guess correctly. So now we have these uh, five security, uh, these four security notions, and I just want to say, yes. Can I just ask, a, is there any uh, reason, is there any weakness in message privacy that you you prefer even to sit around encryption? We don't really care that in general for encryption we don't ask for encryption to be sit around and that can be often in, in practice, but we don't. It's, there isn't any real security advantage to that. So, so you're asking wh why go weaker than message privacy? No, that I can understand. Why would you go? Why go stronger than message privacy? Is there anything? Are you losing? It doesn't seem to be you're losing any. Are you losing anything in message privacy? I don't think that you do for applications. So the question was, you know, maybe kind of like why start with pseudorandom permutation security? I think um, this is the the holy grail, right? I mean, this this for sure is good enough. For sure, if if you're you're just, your uh, encryption is just pseudorandom, then the ciphertext reveals nothing about the message. And it looks like the natural definition. So I think you start out there. Encryption it's the simplest for definition. Encryption we don't define it I'll tell you, I'll tell you what. I mean, I think if I need to explain this to non-cryptographers, I would prefer doing the pseudorandom permutation definition than the message privacy one. So it's simpler. I think it's easier to formulate. It's clearly enough, and there is, I think there is um, reason to talk about it, to say that you can't do this efficiently, right? You won't be able to get this. We really need, I think if I would start with message privacy, then someone would come up here and say, but it's not pseudorandom, why aren't you doing, why aren't you asking for more? And then I would have to tell him or her that I can't do any better if I want efficiency. Hopefully, we didn't waste 15 minutes discussing this. But I think it, I mean, I think it, it shows something. Yes? Yeah. So thanks, Hugo, for the invited question. So, um, so we have four security notions. And they're kind of, Sasha discussed distinct chosen plaintext attack where you only have encryption oracles, this is the realm we're in. And we can, strengthen, we can strengthen this and talk about indistinguishability of distinct chosen ciphertext attack security. So what does this mean? It means that the adversary is given a decryption oracle. So in the PRP security, this would be strong PRP. The real world adversary has a decryption oracle. The ideal world adversary has um, the inverse of the permutation. 
for single point indistinguishability, message privacy, and message recovery, the strong notions in the uh, real world, the adversary gets a decryption um, uh, oracle. And in the ideal world, it gets nothing. It gets nothing other than testing for equality, because what is the inverse of testing for equality? That's just giving you the message. So there are these notions. And you can also talk about like adaptive, non-adaptive, all these things that I'm not going to go into. We're going to stick with the uh, chosen plain text attack security for these sessions. So there is no decryption uh, oracle, usually. Only the encryption oracle. So I've um, kind of given you the, these four definitions. And I've told you that they're, I'm going from strongest to weakest. But the question is, I don't know, do you believe me or not? So let's discuss a little bit the relations between these definitions. So the first thing is that PRP and SPI, they're equivalent. And we already discussed this. Um, and because you ask a, asked about this uh, quite a bit, I'd like to kind of give you an idea of where this Q over M comes from. Um, so I'm going to discuss a little bit the direction from PRP to SPI, which is the simpler one. So what are we starting out with? We're starting with this adversary A, which is an SPI adversary. And, um, and we want to say this adversary can't have a big advantage in distinguishing between one encryption of, of um, uh, one actual encryption from one random point. And in order to do that, what we would do is we would construct a PRP adversary and show that the PRP adversary can do quite as well as the uh, SPI adversary, so it, the SPI adversary can't do too well. So this um, A prime that we construct is going to kind of simulate the answers to A. So how is this going to look like? So A sends over this T star, N star, M star, this challenge that it wants to be queried on. So with probability half, uh, A prime is going to answer according to its oracle. And with probability half, it's going to answer with random. And then whenever A makes, A, A makes encryption queries, then A prime sends, his, uh, sends over these encryptions to his own oracle. So what is this oracle? This oracle can either be an actual encryption oracle, or it could be some permutation. So if we're, in this case, if we answered with probability half according to our oracle, um, sorry, if we're in this case, in, uh, in the case in which the actual oracle of uh, A prime is an encryption oracle, then what did we do? With probability half, we're answering with an actual encryption query. With probability half, we're answering with random. This is the challenge um, uh, query, the challenge encryption. And all other encryption queries, we're answering with an encryption oracle. So this is just the SPI game. So the advantage here is going to be the same as the advantage here. What happens if we're here? So what happened? With probability half, we answered with a random query. With probability half, we answered with a random query. And all other queries, we answered with a random query. This is the same experiment. There is no advantage here. You cannot distinguish between the same experiment. Except that I lied. Because here, when you answer with your oracle, you're actually answering with the same, you know, with an image which is consistent with all the other um, answers you're going to give. Whereas when you answer with a random answer, you know, you just you give out the answer. Maybe later on, A is going to make some encryption query that you send to this uh, uh, this random permutation, and you're gonna get back, oops, the same image because you have no idea what this pi is. Now, what's the probability of this happening? It's 1 over n for every query, the probability that you would kind of choose the bat, you know, choose something that the adversary A is going to ask later on, ask about. And then you have q queries. So union bound is q over m. So your loss here, the q over m, comes from the fact that you first give the adversary his answer, and you might answer with something that would collide later on. So this is because you asked. And I think we'll break here and we'll continue um, after we get some coffee.